Peace marchers attacked. Pope Francis prays for the victims of twin bombings at an anti-violence march in Ankara, Turkey. Outrageous injustice. That's what the Washington Post calls Iran's conviction of one of its journalists. Not convinced. Wisconsin's Paul Ryan isn't biting at the House Republicans' bid to draft him for the Speaker's job. And servants of God. 82 martyrs of La Florida Mission are a step closer to sainthood today. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Columbus Day, Monday, October 12th, 2015. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Is the Islamic State behind twin suicide bombings in Turkey that killed nearly 100 people and injured hundreds more? The bombings rocked the capital city of Ankara Saturday. Jason Calvi reports on the government's investigation from the Turkish embassy here in Washington. Jason. Brian, no one has yet claimed responsibility for the attacks. Turkey's deputy prime minister says they are close to naming the bombers. And a Turkish newspaper says investigators are focusing on the Islamic State. Turkey is mourning. And even here, the flag is at half staff. <laughs> Turkish and Kurdish activists were rallying for peace. But their calls for increased democracy and peace between Turkey and Kurdish rebels ended in bloodshed. Turkey says 97 people died in two suicide bombings. And hundreds were hurt. Pope Francis led a moment of silent prayer for the victims. The Holy Father saying the attack leaves much pain in its wake especially since the victims were standing up for peace. In Turkey, loved ones are burying the dead. <laughs> and police have scoured the bombing site for evidence. Now, a makeshift memorial. In Ankara today, protesters are condemning the bombing. Some accuse the government of not doing enough to protect those who rallied Saturday. Others saying the government was behind the attack. <laughs> But this protester says he'll continue to demand peace and democracy despite the massacre. Turkish police have arrested 45 people they say are members of the Islamic State since Saturday, but it's unclear if these arrests have anything to do with the bombings. Now, Turkey's deputy prime minister says the attacks were meant to sow discord in the country. He's urging unity. Brian? From the Turkish embassy, Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. The Washington Post calls the conviction of its reporter detained in Iran an outrageous injustice. Journalist Jason Rezaian has been jailed in Iran for more than a year. Today, he is found guilty on charges including espionage. Iranian state TV calls him an American spy. Rezaian grew up in California and holds both American and Iranian citizenship. The Post says Iran is convicting an innocent journalist of serious crimes with no evidence of wrongdoing. Following today's conviction, Rezaian's brother Ali released this statement. Jason was simply a journalist doing his job and following all the rules when he was wrongly arrested and imprisoned. We remain hopeful that Jason will soon be released and reunited with our family. Hundreds of asylum seekers now outnumber the locals in a small Dutch town. Refugees from Syria, Sudan, and Eritrea stay in an unused vacation camp in Orange, Netherlands. The town's population was 130 before 700 refugees arrived. This tiny town is the latest flashpoint in the debate over accommodating thousands of migrants pouring into Europe. One of them says the Dutch locals treat him kindly. People here are always smiling, uh, helping, uh, like, you know, we are a one family. So uh, we appreciate all of this. More European parks and sports facilities are now being used for emergency housing. The Vatican's team charged with addressing sex abuse of minors by clergy finishes its second meeting. The Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors later met with the media. They're working on guidelines for safeguarding children, healing and care for victims, and the formation of candidates to the priesthood and religious life. What's not negotiable is that, you know, we have to be very clear that sexual abuse is not to be tolerated in the church. 
um, and that's irrespective of culture. The panel meets again in February. Meanwhile, the Vatican briefings on the ongoing synod continue. Today, married couples participating in the meeting spoke with reporters. Even in India, we are very serious about marriage preparation courses. Every week we have about 250 couples coming for marriage preparation courses. And most of the couples are interfaith couples. Penny and her husband are in Rome for the Synod. She says young people in India are very interested in church doctrine on marriage. Alan Holdren is joining us from Rome, covering the Synod on the family. Alan, this meeting is all about families. So how are families and married couples participating? Well, Brian, the, the families, these married couples, there are nearly 20 of them, are in the Synod Hall along with all of these bishops participating as what is called auditors. They're there to listen in, and they're also invited to participate by giving their testimonies to the entire Synod Hall. Uh, also, when uh, the bishops divide into these small discussion groups, the, the couples are also present there and invited to give their perspectives. Uh, one small character that's also participating in these discussions, uh, obviously not speaking very much as a four-month-old baby who's the child of one of these couples. Speaking with his presence there, certainly. So we heard about marriage preparation in the briefing. What other topics came up? Uh, with, within the, uh, the briefing that we had at the press office today, um, there was word about also preparation for couples after they're married, formation, catechesis, uh, working with them to understand what is expected of them uh, as a married couple and how they can continue to grow in their love for each other and their love for Christ. Uh, there was also speak about the definition of mercy, the definition also of the doctrine of the church on marriage, and uh, also the methodology, the way that this synod is taking place. There have been a lot of questions about uh, how the synod fathers should advance towards the end and what they should be giving to the Holy Father as their proposals for how uh, marriage and the family can uh, be, be best accompanied by the church in this day and age. So this is week two of the three-week synod. What is the schedule for this week, Alan? Well, they continue to speak about this uh, guiding document, Brian, which is the result of questionnaires that were sent out to the different dioceses of the world, which families and uh, their pastors were asked about what the family needs today. And also, uh, they're using the results of last year's synod, which uh, was, was held in advance of this one, to, in order to provide a complete picture of where the family is today. They're going to be dividing up into small discussion groups uh, to, to speak about the challenges to the family uh, according to the guiding document for this synod process, Brian. Alan Holdren keeping us up to date on the Synod on the Family in Rome. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Brian. And back here in the States, House Republicans wonder who will be their next leader. The new favorite, of course, is former vice presidential candidate who is still not convinced he wants the job. It's the right man at the right moment. Representative Paul Ryan is under pressure from fellow Republicans to run for Speaker of the House. He told CNN on Sunday his answer is still no. But according to Ryan's allies, he's still trying to make up his mind. He certainly shouldn't do it if he's not willing to embrace it. Ryan emerged as a favorite after Representative Kevin McCarthy's surprise announcement last week that he would not run. Friends of the Ways and Means Committee chairman say Ryan will only take the job if he gets support from all 247 GOP House members. Members of the party's Conservative Freedom Caucus have another candidate in mind. He's Congressman Daniel Webster of Florida. Until somebody's a declared candidate, we're not going to move to a new candidate. But Sunday, the group's leader said the Freedom Caucus would look favorably on Ryan if he decides to step in. Ryan's possible candidacy is coming up on the campaign trail. GOP frontrunner Donald Trump told CBS's Face the Nation. I think he doesn't want it very badly, but you never know. Maybe he's playing one of the great games of all time. And Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal summed up the GOP's problem on ABC's This Week. I like Paul a lot, but the question is, what commitment will the next speaker make to the conference about fighting for our beliefs? Meanwhile, President Obama defends his former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, while calling her use of a private email server a mistake. Meanwhile, the Republican National Committee releases a new attack ad focused on the controversy, as Catherine Zeltner reports. 
President Barack Obama, in an interview with CBS's 60 Minutes, addresses Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. I don't think it posed a national security problem. I think that it, uh, it was a mistake that she's acknowledged. He says the controversy has been ginned up because of politics. This is one of those uh, issues that I think is legitimate, but uh, the fact that for the last three months this is all that's been uh, spoken about is an indication that we're in presidential political season. The issue has certainly dogged Clinton's campaign. I did not email any classified material. The Republican National Committee paid for this new attack ad accusing Clinton of misleading the public. The tagline reads, Hillary Clinton is not telling the truth again. Though U.S. agencies have retroactively classified hundreds of Clinton's emails, she says none of it was classified at the time it was sent. The RNC is releasing the ad ahead of Tuesday's Democratic debate, targeting supporters of her biggest primary rival up to this point, Senator Bernie Sanders. Katherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Katherine. Jim Antle is politics editor for the Washington Examiner. What do you think this ad and the comments by the president means to Hillary's campaign going into the debate? Well, everybody, including Hillary Clinton and President Obama, acknowledge it's a mistake. The question is whether they're willing to acknowledge the national security and transparency issues raised by her use of the private server. I think it's a big issue, and it's going to continue to be a big issue, reinforcing concerns people have over her trustworthiness. So is it an issue just for the Republicans, or do you think this will get into the debate tomorrow night? I think you are going to hear a little bit about it in the debate. Martin O'Malley has been willing to raise it in the past, Bernie Sanders less so. I think it does hit a core character concern that people have, and a lot of these candidates aren't going to have many other chances to attack Hillary on even terms. They'll be a little nervous about it because they don't know how Democratic primary voters will react to her being criticized in that way. Let's talk about Sanders a little bit. We haven't heard a whole lot from him. He draws big crowds. Is he a viable candidate? Well, the big question is whether he'd be viable in a general election, but he certainly has appealed to a lot of Democrats, and I think he appeals on some issues that might cut across the political spectrum. To really move from being sort of an interesting footnote to this campaign to a serious challenger for Hillary Clinton, I think he has to do a lot better with minority voters than he's doing right now. What do you think we'll hear from him tomorrow night? I think Sanders is going to try to show that he's not just a, a one-dimensional economic populism candidate. I think he's going to try to appeal to African-American and Latino voters, talking about his immigration views and shoring up some of his bona fides on some of the uh, more multicultural progressive issues. And maybe he'll mix it up a little bit with Hillary Clinton. Let's go to the speaker situation in the House. If Paul Ryan keeps saying no, right. who's next? Well, that's exactly the problem, is that there isn't really a consensus candidate, and that's why they keep going after Paul Ryan, even though he's saying no. So the hope, I think, among House Republicans is that there's some set of conditions uh, that will make him say yes. If there isn't, then I don't think there's one obvious candidate. I think what you're going to see is a bunch of people getting in, and then you're going to see a lot of horse trading and, and real political infighting among the conference until somebody can get to 218. Of course, you have a bunch of people running for president as Republicans. So doesn't the GOP really need to get this leadership issue resolved or go into this critical election year in disarray? I think the benefit of having so many candidates and having this leadership fight is it shows a party that's willing to have debates, willing to have internal discussions and have diversity uh, among views and among st strategies. But yes, there is always the risk that if you have all these people duking it out and never getting unified, that it's going to look like chaos, especially to independent voters. Yeah, it depends on how it all ends. If a leader arises from the mess, then it'll work out okay. Right. Jim Antle, thanks for joining us from the Washington Examiner. A Princeton University professor wins the Nobel Prize in Economics. The award is for his work redefining the way global poverty is measured. 69-year-old Angus Deaton says he's concerned with the world's poor. He believes economic averages, such as national income, can be misleading. In his work, the Scotland native focuses on health, well-being, and development. After today's announcement, Deaton called into a news conference. I'm so delighted, not just for myself, but that this sort of work is being recognized. That's a wonderful thing. Deaton was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and holds U.S. and British dual citizenship. Coming up, a Cajun cook who won the hearts of America is buried today. And honoring Christopher Columbus in our nation's capital on this national holiday.
Columbus Day celebrations in Washington, D.C. today. Thank you for joining us on this Monday evening, October the 12th. I'm Brian Patrick. The Bishop of the Pensacola Tallahassee Diocese celebrates Mass to open the cause of the Martyrs of La Florida Missions today. Antonio Quipa and 81 companions are now called Servants of God. Quipa was a leading Appalachian Indian chief of present-day Tallahassee, Florida, who was martyred in 1704. Lynn Mangan is vice postulator for the cause of the Martyrs of La Florida Missions, joining us by Skype from Tallahassee, Florida. Lynn, how did you discover the 82 martyrs in Florida? Um, well, there is a group of uh, families in Tallahassee who many years ago, at least 10 years ago, um, were trying to understand the history of a piece of land. And we are, for the most part, we're just lay um, you know, moms and dads and not historians. So we are quick to connect with our Catholic theologians and historians to help us to, um, to understand the story. And so since then, we've been blessed. We've prayed a lot, and we've been blessed with uh, help from archivists and historians to uh, dig out the history that many Catholics in this country or, or many Amer most Americans don't really know the Catholic history of our country of La Florida, the you know 200 year Catholic history. And so through this project of looking and uh, finding this land and trying to understand, we, um, we began researching and now we do know all the individual um, martyrs of La Florida. Well, certainly we are finding out more about them today. Can you tell us more about Antonio Quipa, the lead martyr? Yes, uh, Antonio was an Apalachee Indian, and he was from Mission San Luis, which is modern-day Tallahassee. He was what we call a Renaissance man, really, because he was very, he was brilliant himself. He was a great student who mastered his Latin and catechism from the Franciscans, and he became a teacher. He was uh, a singer, a guitarist. He played the flute. He made from reed pipes uh, flutes, and he would uh, became actually a missionary himself, where he would go to Native Americans, Native uh, you know other Indians who were not Christians, and he would bring flutes as gifts to share with others. And through this process, through music, he started to share the gospel. So he would also bring a crucifix. And he would tell them this God that you already know had a son. And then he would tell the story of the incarnation. Um, yeah. Antonio also had a deep, beautiful devotion to St. Joseph. He wanted, he was a carpenter. And he said he wanted to be like St. Joseph because he wanted his people to be one single holy family. Beautiful story. And we'll hear more about it. Lynn Mangan, thanks for joining us from Tallahassee tonight. Thank you. A massive Christian burial is celebrated for the chef who brought Louisiana's rural Cajun cooking to the forefront of American cuisine. Paul Prudhomme died Thursday after a brief illness. He was 75. His funeral was held today at St. Louis Catholic, or Cathedral in New Orleans. With no formal training, Prudhomme stirred up a nationwide appetite for gumbo, jambalaya, and other great Cajun dishes. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and today, under blue skies in our nation's capital, the great explorer is honored. A giant statue of Columbus stands outside DC's Union Station. The Knights of Columbus processed as the United States Marine Band played. Officials from Spanish and Italian embassies spoke. Claude Boyd won this year's National Christopher Columbus Essay Contest. He wrote about the dangerous voyage to the New World. Well, it's the rather cliche saying, no pain, no gain. You gotta take risks side. And he found something that changed the world forever. Memorial wreaths were presented at today's celebration of the vision and the courage of this Italian explorer. Up next, pro-life activists rally this weekend in support of efforts to defund Planned Parenthood. And the Vatican opens a homeless shelter run by Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity. Today, October 12th, is the Feast of Our Lady of the Pillar. Tradition says she appeared in Spain in the early days of Christianity and is now the patroness of that country. Thanks for joining us on this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Thousands of pro-lifers rally Saturday, the second national day of Planned Parenthood protests. About 20,000 people showed up to nearly 300 Planned Parenthood locations in all 50 states. The protests are a response to the recent undercover videos exposing the abortion provider. 
The protesters want Planned Parenthood to be stripped of its hundreds of millions in federal funding. Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List, a pro-life group that co-sponsored Saturday's protest. The number's still coming in, but you say they're really actually higher than 20,000. Yeah, I think in the end it'll be about 70,000. Uh, in August it was about 78. The good news is they're holding steady because people do lose attention pretty quickly, but this is something that should not be lost, certainly in the fray. Why do you think that these protests the, the visibility of people, keeping this in the forefront is so important. There are, a, there are a couple of things that are really incredible happening right now. For the first time in 40 years where since the Congress has been funding this organization, the profile is very high. There's a high profile presidential debate over the over whether they are obeying the law, about what's going on in Planned Parenthood clinics. There are committee hearings going on almost every week in the Congress. This has really never happened. We'll be talking about judiciary committees coming up in the Senate very soon. Uh, and so the, the high profile conversation is continuing and it'll probably continue tomorrow night in the Democratic presidential debate. So the hearings that are going on on Capitol Hill, some of them seem to fall a little flat. Do you think they're making any kind of a difference? I think we're making our way. I mean, yeah, I think you're right that they're not perfect. I think that in the end what you really want is for a couple things to happen. You want uh, the, the um, humanity of the unborn child to be the most important thing that comes out. But the Congress's job is to truly look at, um, have scrutiny and look at organizations that we're funding and see where they're breaking the law. In the process of checking about where they're breaking the law and bringing Planned Parenthood officials forward, we're going to achieve both of those ends. But I think it is still very new. I think that we could do a very good job of, uh, especially with our friends in the Congress, being a little bit better prepared from time to time. Because I can tell you, Cecile Richards, the pleasant president of Planned Parenthood, will be well prepared every single She's time. Well prepared. And Why aren't they just showing the videos? Mm -hmm. Are they not allowed to do that? You'd think if they would just show the videos and say, how do you respond to this? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, it's debatable whether they can show them or not. And I believe I'm on the side of the debate that says you absolutely can. And every time you show the video, you will be able to link it to something very important for the committee to address. So that is, uh, that I believe is the Planned Parent, is the actual, the, the thing that Planned Parenthood really fears, and it's the thing that the pro-life movement really wants. And truly, a lot of members on Capitol Hill are moving in that direction. I think we'll see that. One of the things that's very difficult to hear are some of the Democratic leaders saying, this is just a waste of time. Oh. Do you see it presented that way in the Democratic debate tomorrow night? Oh, yes, because yeah. they will be vying to be who gets to be Planned Parenthood's best friend. The cash coming out of that organization, the cash coming out of our pocketbooks going to that organization is immense. And each one of those candidates needs Planned Parenthood's endorsement. And they also need the base that they are all appealing to. I mean, remember what these what these debates are generally about at this point. They're trying to solidify their base. That base is very extreme. So we will see some really extreme statements coming out of each of the mouths of those, of those folks vying to be the Democratic candidate. So any discussion of this probably, though, is, is good for the cause. It's, it's all good. Because honestly, the truth sets you free. Clarity is everything in politics and often in life. And when we get to the general election and we have candidates who have exposed really the horror at the, at the center of the Planned Parenthood endeavor and the horror of late-term abortion and children born alive so that we can harvest their parts, and then on the, you see on the other side, you know, some folks trying to defend that, uh, in the name of women's rights, of all things. That's the kind of contrast we want in the pro-life election. Marjorie Dannon felzer with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thanks again for coming to, Thanks for having to see us. Me. Well, today is the halfway point for 40 Days for Life, the fall campaign. We're hearing some inspiring stories. That pro-life group reports at least 251 babies have now been saved from abortion. 40 Days for Life is a campaign of prayer, fasting, and peaceful vigil to end abortion. More than 300 cities are involved in the campaign, which ends on All Saints Day, November 1st. And the Vatican opens its own homeless shelter just steps from St. Peter's Square. The dormitory can house nearly three dozen men per night. Pope Francis's chief charity minister inaugurated the shelter last week with mass for the guests and volunteers. It is operated by Mother Teresa's Sisters or Missionaries of Charity, funded by donations and from the Vatican itself. It's the latest papal initiative to help the homeless around the Vatican Earlier this year, showers and a free barber shop opened near St. Peter's Square. Until tomorrow, we encourage you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on our YouTube page. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night. God bless you.